Welcome to another episode of Mike's Money Picks. Today on the podcast, we're going to be bringing down the big Monday slate of college basketball DFS. That's right, Monday, February 19th, 2024. We've got a little three-game slate on DraftKings as well as FanDuel. I swear, like ESPN with the big Monday deal, they used to have more nationally televised games. And I feel like there used to be bigger DraftKings slates as well. Maybe I'm crazy misremembering that, but I feel like Mondays didn't used to just be the domain of these small two and three-game slates. Anyway, we've got two games on this slate. They're going to be... um, not the best if you're a fan of modern offensive basketball. And one game that should be pretty exciting between two teams that like to score a lot of points and not play a lot of defense. So this is going to be a really interesting one to target in terms of how can you prioritize each game and who can you get from each game um, and have them, you know, have a ceiling performance. So what we're going to do here in this episode, we're going to break down all three games uh, and tell you kind of what you can expect from the game environment of each game and who you need to be targeting or not targeting in your DraftKings and FanDuel lineups in that game. Now, before we get started, I do want to mention this. If you are new to the channel, welcome. Glad to have you. Um, go ahead and hit the like button on the video. It really does help me out a lot, and I really do appreciate it. Um, if you like what you see later on, like after you watch the video and you want to hit the like button, that's cool. Also, um, if you're listening on audio, please rate and review. Again, I promise it helps me out a ton, and I really do appreciate when you guys do that. And also, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you can be with us for the rest of college basketball season. Now, if you are new, um, you might not be used to kind of like our weekly schedule. We kind of got in a little bit of a routine here where I am here for the Monday slate and then I'm usually not here for the Tuesday slate because I usually do a Monday night PGA Tour golf episode. So if you are interested in hearing my thoughts on the Tuesday slate, Make sure you join the Fantasy Corner Discord. The link is in the description. I have gone on record for saying I think we have the best Discord in all of college basketball DFS. A lot of smart people bouncing a lot of ideas off each other and then sweating out together. It's a blast to be a part of. Um, I will be in there talking lineups, talking strategy all day Tuesday. Um, so, you know, if you do not, um, you know, if you miss the video on Tuesday, make sure you join the Discord, get in there, get in on the discussion. And also, I will have a full article to my Patreon on Tuesday. On my Patreon, I write articles for every college basketball slate where I profile my core play as well as kind of how I am going to have a lineup strategy and attack strategy for each slate. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and just guarantee that you're going to win GPPs doing that, but I do believe that I provide sound information that not a whole lot of people do and not a whole lot of people have. Um, and I do think that it can help you build your own process and, and you know build and get you better at college basketball DFS. All right, so enough with the introduction. I had to go ahead and get that out there because a lot of people always ask me like, hey, where are you at Tuesday? And you know my answer is always like, hey, I, you know, I do the Monday Night Golf episode. So um, let's go ahead and dive into game one of the slate, the battle for the state of Virginia. All right, so the first game of the slate is featuring the Virginia Cavaliers heading on over to Blacksburg to take on the Virginia Tech Hokies. And this is one of the game environments on this slate that is, um, let's just say, not the greatest. You know, I don't want to say like the worst game environment of all time, but like it's pretty bad. So this game, uh, Ken Palm has projected to be 65 to 62 in favor of Virginia Tech. 127 point total makes it the lowest total on this three game slate, which is saying a lot after you hear about game two. Um, so this is just a game that we don't really want to go out of our way to target, but there are still some guys that you can get to. This is actually a rematch. This game's already been played this season. Virginia won the first matchup in Charlottesville, 65 to 57. That is only a 122 point total in that one. So there's not really a whole lot of cause for optimism for a whole lot of points being scored in this one. And why is that? Well, it's because of Virginia. We've gone over this all season, but they rank dead last in the nation in tempo, 362nd out of 362 teams and eighth in defensive efficiency according to Ken Palm. So you're looking at a team that plays slow as crap and plays elite defense and forces long possessions as a part of playing that great defense. This just creates a game environment where not a whole lot of possessions means not a whole lot of fantasy points scored. So um, who can you target from this game? Well, it is worth noting that in that game one, where Virginia won by only scoring 65 points, Reese Beekman, Reese Beekman was pretty good. He had 34 fantasy points in that game, um, and he put that up on a 27% usage rate, 6 for 13 from the field, 16 of 4 and 4 was his line. Um, that's a pretty solid line for Reese Beekman. I think he's an elite cash game play here on this slate. I do not think he has the upside of some of the other 8K and 7K guards. Like, you look at his game log, he has only hit 5X value once in conference play, um, and that was against Georgia Tech, which is a much juicier matchup than this Virginia Tech team. But the way that 
Virginia plays, even though Reese Beekman is going to get a ton of usage, he's going to get you a lot of peripheral stats as well. He just it, It's hard for him to have ceiling games because of how they play. And so for that reason, I think he's a solid cash game play, but I probably would not be rolling him out in tournaments. I think there's other guards that have more higher ceilings than he does. Now, also worth noting in that game was Jordan Miner had a really big time game in the first matchup. Um, he was able to play 27 minutes, put up 28 fantasy points in that one, which was, I believe it's his highest output of the season. Yes, it is his highest fantasy point output of the season. But the problem is now is like, you can't just go right back to him and just hope that you're going to get the same result because right now he's not playing the same minute total that he was back at that point in the season. Right now he is splitting minutes at the center position with Jake Groves, who's sitting at $5,200 on DraftKings, as well as Blake Buchanan, the freshman who started the season at center before eventually giving that starting spot to Jordan Miner. So this is like, this is probably the position on Virginia that has like the highest upside because of what Miner did in the first game. But the problem is if none of these guys are going to play 25 plus minutes, it makes them really hard to target. Recently, Blake Buchanan has been playing the most minutes out of the three of them, but he hasn't really been super productive from a fantasy perspective. So with it being a three game slate, I get it if you want to take shots on these three Virginia centers, but it's definitely not like a safe play by any stretch of the imagination. And if you're playing GPPs, do I think you can mix in a, you know, a rotation of minor Buchanan and um, Jake Groves. I think you can, but it's just not a great consistent situation. Now, the guy I do like though is Ryan Dunn. So Ryan Dunn has been, he's been Virginia's small ball center at some points this season. And he eventually kind of became now a small ball power forward or just a normal small forward. And he has been really hot and cold in conference play. Like he's had, you know, two games over 39 points. Um, and he's also had, you know, a few games in the single digits. So you don't really know what you're going to get from him. In that first matchup against Virginia Tech, he played 26 minutes and only put up 18 fantasy points, which is not great. But the power forward spot is a way that you can attack Virginia Tech. We've seen it recently with Harrison Ingram having a big game um, against Virginia Tech this weekend. The, I think that this guy might have the best DVP matchup or defense versus position matchup out of all of the Virginia guys. And he's probably the most likely guy that I'm going to get to out of anybody on this side. Now, Isaac McNeely is an interesting one. He's like, I don't know. He's kind of like your Reese Beekman pivot, but like he also benefits from Beekman's assists. Um, you know, he is second on the team in usage and conference play, and he is second on the team in shot rate, but he doesn't really have a whole lot of huge fantasy games, and he did not have a huge one against Virginia Tech, only putting up 16.5 fantasy points in the first meeting. Um, so minimal interest in McNeely and all the rest of the other Virginia Cavaliers as well. Now on the Virginia Tech side, Sean Padula and Hunter Couture were the only two Hokies to hit 4x value in the first matchup against Virginia. That's what tends to happen against Virginia, and when you only score 57 points, there's just not a whole lot of fancy points being scored. In that game, Padula had a massive 42% usage rate and put up 31.5 fancy points in 32 minutes on 6 for 16 shooting. I'm willing to go back to him at that. Like, I think he has at least as high of a ceiling as Reese Beekman, and he's priced up $1,000 below Reese Beekman. You know, he's had multiple games of 50 fancy points this season. Season. And even when his efficiency has not been there, the usage has still been there. And so like recently, you know, he has not been that great from the field shooting 33% or worse in the last three games, but the usage is still there. The shot attempts are still there. And so I'm willing to go back to Padula on this one and, and hope that he can do what he did in the last matchup. Now, if you've been following Virginia for a while, you know that they play the pack line defense where they pretty much try to eliminate dribble drives to the basket for basically, um, very much simplifying the pack line defense. They don't want guys driving straight to the basket unabated. And so what that creates is situations where three-point shooters will get a lot of looks against Virginia. And for this Virginia Tech team, it's going to be two guys that are shooting those threes. The first of which is Hunter Couture, who, as I mentioned earlier, did have a good game against Virginia the first time, 26 fancy points on five for 10 shooting. And then the second guy, is going to be MJ Collins, who has been a little more up and down um, as opposed to Hunter Couture. Only nine fancy points against Virginia the first time, but he was red hot against Carolina, seven for 15. For Well, I guess that's not really red hot, seven for 15, but he did hit enough shots to put up 28 fantasy points. And so I do think that those two guys have a little bit of upside because you know that the three-point looks are going to be there just based off of how Virginia plays defense. Now, after those two, Tower Nickel and Robbie Barron are like the two – 
power forward ish players on this team. Robbie Barron is like your normal power forward, and I just don't think he's a great fantasy option, if I'm being honest. Um, you know, only 19 fantasy points in that first game against Virginia, but that was only on 18 minutes played. And that's kind of like the outlier for him in terms of a fantasy points per minute perspective. The minutes have been inconsistent lately as well because he's been dealing with foul trouble. So, not my favorite target. And, and Tower Nichols kind of the same way. He's another guy, though, that he's going to take some threes. And so maybe if you get a hot game from behind the arc, which he's had each of the last two games, combined seven for 10 from three in his last two, then maybe you could get some value out of Tower Nickel. And he has dual eligibility, so he's a little easier to play. Lynn Kidd is Virginia Tech's starting um, center, and he has been really up and down this season. First game against Virginia was a down. He only played 16 minutes and put up seven fancy points. That was kind of the beginning of seeing, I'm going to butcher this name, Malajel Poti. I think I pronounced that right. I actually coached against this kid when he was in high school. Um, he was really good in high school, by the way. Um, that was the start of Poti kind of stealing um, the minutes of Lynn Kidd. And even in that one, though, Poti played 21 minutes, but he only put up 9.25 fantasy points. And so I do I think Poti has a little bit of upside at 4,800. Yeah, but like the matchup just makes it really hard to target. And so if I'm targeting these Virginia Tech guys, it's probably going to be with Padua and then one of the shooters, Couture, Collins, or Tower Nick. Heading on to game number two, we've got Iowa State taking on Houston. And um, if you thought the first game environment was bad, this one is slightly better. Um, Kent Palm has this one projected to be Houston 69 to 60, which is two points of a higher total um, than Virginia, Virginia Tech. However, the first meeting was an absolute rock fight. Um, the first meeting, Iowa State actually won in Hilton Coliseum 57 to 53 for a 110 point total. Yeah, so this is not exactly the best game environment either. Now, in the original matchup for Iowa State, they only scored 57 points, but Trey King had a big-time game. Um, Trey King kind of had these big games out of nowhere, um, you know, and that Houston one was a pretty big one. He had 25, or I'm sorry, 28 fancy points in that one. Um, and then, you know, a little bit later, he had a random big game against Kansas as well with 35 fancy points. Is there any rhyme or reason as to when he has a big game? No, but the ceiling's there. He's only $5,100. I don't mind it. I think in the landscape of the rest of the $5,000 forward plays, I think he's probably one of the best bets. Um, now, after that, the next highest scoring fantasy player in that first game for Iowa State was Tamman Lipsy, um, who put up 22 fantasy points. So, yeah, you're hearing me correctly. Iowa State only had two guys score 22 fantasy points or higher against Houston the first time. It's not great. It's not an environment that you want to go out of your way to target. Now, in that game, Lipsy had, um, you know, four for nine from the field, five for nine from the free throw line, and decent usage rate in that one. And we've seen Lipsy kind of carry these big usage rates throughout the season, right? And in that game, Lipsy, as well as other guard, Kashawn Gilbert, did lead the team in usage. Um, and so that's kind of like what you can expect, again, is that, you know, those two guys are going to be the guys taking most of the shots getting most of the looks, getting most of the assists. And so I kind of don't mind playing one of them. I, I don't think that there's going to be a pathway to playing two of them together, Gilbert and Lipsy, because what you would be asking for is if you play Gilbert and Lipsy together at a combined salary of about $15,000, you're going to want at least 60, if not like 70 fantasy points out of the two of those guys, you know, to be viable. And I just don't see that happening against this Houston defense. Houston literally ranks 346th in the nation in tempo and first in defensive efficiency. The only metric they're not elite in is that they do give up a decent amount of assists and Gilbert and Lipsy do both have over a 24% assist rate on the season. So could I see one of them getting there? Yes, absolutely. That's kind of a roundabout what I was trying to get to is I think that one of Gilbert or Lipsy can end up having a game where they hit value, but it's very unlikely that it's both. Now, after that, I mean, I don't like really targeting tertiary players going up against Houston, but like, you know, you got Robert Jones, Curtis Jones, Milan Manchilovic, Hassan Ward, like they're all going to play minutes. They're all going to be out there, but it's just not an environment that's going to see a whole lot of total fantasy points scored. And so I'm not really going out of my way to play them. If you play enough lineups and GPPs, can you take shots at them? Yeah. Mom Chilovic is probably the guy that could get hot from behind the arc, but he hasn't really done so lately. He's missed his last five threes. Um, so I, again, with this Iowa State team, I kind of want to make it either just King or just Gilbert or Lipsy in terms of who I'm targeting. Now on the Houston side, Houston to me is a much easier team to target. 
Well, first off, they're nine-point favorites in this game, so that that helps a little bit. But to me, Iowa State's defense is a lot easier to predict than what you're going to get out of a lot of the other teams on the slate. Iowa State plays very good defense. They also play a little bit of kind of a similar style to that Virginia pack line, right? And they are bottom 12 in the nation at giving up assists and three-point shots taken. So basically, Iowa State's defense is going to create a lot of catch-and-shoot three-point opportunities from a guy who started on a dribble drive. And with us for Houston, we know who's going to be taking the threes, and we know who's going to be passing it to them. That makes it a much easier situation to target in DFS because then if the guys hit the threes, you know that you're going to be the guy getting the fantasy points. So um, for them, Emmanuel Sharp is going to be one of the guys taking those threes, and he was great in the first meeting against Iowa State. He put up 30 fantasy points points on five for 10 from behind the arc. Um, that's pretty solid, especially at a salary of only $6,200. And he's even better of a value on FanDuel. Um, I really like getting to Emmanuel Sharp. If you don't want to go with Sharp, you could also go with LJ Cryer who um, in that first game only had 11 fantasy points, but he was one for six from three. So the opportunities are there. And he's normally not that bad of a shooter, you know, just in the last game against Texas, he was six for nine from three. So um, I definitely think that if you're going to be playing this Houston side, go ahead and get you either Cryer or Sharp because they're going to be the two guys that are taking the most threes. You know, Houston's bigs don't shoot threes. So it's going to be Cryer and Sharp, and it's going to be Jamal Shedd passing the ball to them. He leads the team in assist rate. He leads the team in usage rate. And in that first game against Iowa State, he had a 32% usage rate and put up 28 fantasy points, which is not what we want out of Jamal Shedd. But he was five for 15 from the field, one for eight from behind the arc. So like, let's just say he gets two more of those threes and all of a sudden he gets six more fantasy points. Like now you're talking a whole lot better. I think he's a little expensive for my taste on DraftKings, but like he has a massive ceiling and, um, you know, he showed that ceiling with a 55 fantasy point performance against Texas. So I don't, mind getting to Jamal Shedd, especially stacking him with Cryer or Sharp and knowing that when they get these catch and shoot threes, you're going to get the assist as well as the three points for the mate three. Houston's bigs, I have min- like minimal interest in. I like Juwan Roberts as a player. He's just an elite offensive rebounder and really good shot blocker as well. Um, and he tends to be a pretty consistent fantasy option. I think he's a great cash game play, but we haven't seen really bigs you know, have ceiling games against Iowa State. Like, they defended Texas's Dylan DeSue, more on him later, pretty well in the matchup that they played against each other. And so I don't necessarily think that this is the best spot for, like, a ceiling game out of Juwan Roberts, but I don't mind targeting him. And if you want to play the whole foul trouble angle, like, let's say Juwan Roberts gets in foul trouble, then Javier Francis or Joseph Tugger would probably be in line for boosted minutes. And at the guard spot, it would either be Malik Wilson or or Damian Dunn that's going to get extra minutes. The good news is with Houston, they play such a tight rotation that you kind of know who is going to end up getting the minutes for them. But the only interest I would have in Wilson or Dunn is if you're really playing a GPP and you're really banking on Cryer or Sharp getting in foul trouble. All right, that does it for the first two games. Let's take a quick breather before we talk about what is by far the best game environment of the slate. All right, now looking ahead to the last game of the night, we've got Kansas State heading to Austin to the Moody Center to take on Texas. And this is by far the best game environment of the slate. This is going to be where you're probably going to want to get most of your players from. Ken Palm has this game projected to be 73 to 65 in favor of Texas, making Texas the highest um, projected team on the slate. And even though um, Kansas State's projected to be the loser in this one, they're still the tied for the third highest projected team on the slate. So um, the highest game total on, on the slate also is this one and is, is the highest by nine points. So basically, mathematically, everything indicates that this game is going to feature more scoring and and thus more fantasy scoring than each of the first two games. Now, on the Kansas State side, so far this season, I can say this because I am a Texas fan. I've watched most, if not all, their games. Um, you know, I live in North Carolina, so I don't get the Longhorn Network, unfortunately. Um, so those are the only games I haven't watched this year. But knowing what I know about Texas, they have struggled this year against big, physical, ball-dominant guards. And Kansas State has two of them. The Well, not necessarily the bigger physical part, but they have two ball dominant guards, one of which has been Cam Carter. He is the bigger of the two, um, and he has actually been the worst of the two in DFS, though. However, he does have a legitimately solid ceiling. He has hit 5x value for his current salary in two of the last five games. He also has a really solid rebounding rate, and so to me, he kind of fits the mold for the type of guy that has you know done some damage against Texas this season. Tyler Perry is another ball dominant guard that they have, but he is tiny. He is not a big man, um, and so he doesn't necessarily fit the big and physical part, but he does fit the ball dominant part because he takes a lot of shots. And when he hits them, he tends to have a lot of success in fantasy. 
he hasn't had exactly the same ceiling um, that Cam Carter has had. Um, you know, Cam Carter had more 5X games than Tower Perry does. Tyler Perry only has one 5X game in the last five games. However, Tower Perry does have four 4X games in the last five games. So um, definitely um, a situation where I think you can target either Perry or Carter, and I think you can even target both of them together. Both of them hit 4X value together once in the last five games. It was against Kansas. Um, so on a slate like this where – there's not a whole lot of solid game environments. You know, why not try to stack this one up and play both Perry and Carter? Now, Arthur Kaluma is an interesting one because he has not been great lately for this Kansas State team. He's only hit 4X value once in the last five games. Um, he actually played against Texas last year, too, when he was at Creighton, had 13-3-2 in that game, which is not a terrible stat line, but it's not going to cut it when your salary is $6,900. He has been the clear third wheel for this team in terms of usage behind Perry and Carter. However, I do think this could be a spot for him where the matchup might help him out and how uh, Jerome Tang chooses to deploy his rotation could help him out. And what I mean by that is this, Texas generally plays three guards and they're generally three pretty small guards. Arthur Kurluma starts at the four for this Kansas State team, but he does play some minutes at the three. If he does end up at the three and he gets guarded by one of these guards for Texas, that's going to be a clear mismatch. And he's going to be able to get to the rim and finish, you know, strong and above the smaller guards of Texas. So I do think that there's a possibility that you see an Arthur Kaluma ceiling game. Nothing in the numbers is really indicating that, but it's just more of a matchup based play from what I know about these two teams. And if I'm not playing Perry or Carter, then I think Kaluma is a very easy pivot because if Perry and Carter aren't getting there, then it's very likely that Kaluma is. Now, after that, um, Kansas State does have two guys who are starter in name only, um, Day Day Ames as well as Jarrell Colbert. Um, both of these guys start the game and then don't really play a whole lot after that. Um, you know, Colbert played uh, 10 minutes last game against TCU, 3.5 fantasy points in those 10 minutes. And then Day Day Ames started that game as well, played 10 minutes as well, 4.25 fantasy points in that one. For what it's worth, I think Day Day Ames might be one of the best punt plays on the slate just because he does start at guard and we've seen guards get to Texas and um, you know, what, what if he ends up playing 25 minutes? I don't, I don't know. I just, I think there's not a whole lot of very cheap options on this slate. So why not get a guy who, you know, is going to be in the starting lineup and at least play 10 minutes at $3,700. Like I, I think there's worse options out there than him. Now for the bigs for um, Kansas state, you know, I just mentioned that Ames and Colbert um, don't play a whole lot of minutes. That's because the rest of the starting five tends to be McNair and Gasson. They tend to be kind of the crunch time five um, and, you know, be out there as well. Um, and they would probably need a ceiling offensive rebounding game to hit value against Texas, though Texas has been pretty susceptible to the offensive boards. Um, the better rebounder of the two of them is David Ungasan. Um, so I would probably be more inclined to play Ungasan than um, Will McNair. In the last game against TCU, Ungasan played 33 minutes off the bench, put up 26 fantasy points. So um, I don't think he's a very bad option at all. Out of a lot of the 5K forwards that I don't think are all that great options, I think he stands out as one of the best ones, along with Trey King from Iowa State. Now on the Texas side, this to me feels like a Desu and Acemas game. I don't really think that Kansas State has anybody to slow down either of the two of them. Um, so Dylan Desu is a big for Texas who can genuinely score at all three levels and he is one of the best role guys in terms of a pick and roll situation that, that I think there is in college basketball because he can genuinely roll all the way to the rim. He can give you a short roll and hit, you know, a mid range or a short goal floater, and he can pick and pop as well. And it's an offensive weapon for the Longhorns. And when he's hitting from three, then it, he makes a situation where he's really tough to guard. It's really hard to guard Ace Miss or Hunter as well as DeSue in the pick and roll. Um, and so I really like doing DeSue on this slate. Um, we haven't seen, um, you know, him beats the super most consistent option, but out of anybody on the slate, I think he has the highest ceiling. You know, two of his last three games, he's been over 42 fantasy points, with one of those being 55 and a half against Iowa State. So um, definitely um, a situation where I think that DeSue is going to be um, one of the best options on the slate. Did I say earlier that Iowa State slowed down Dylan DeSue? I, I think I might have, I think I might have mentioned the wrong big. There was a big that they slowed down, but it was not Dylan DeSue. Um, now, Max Asmus. 
is another guy who has a legitimately high ceiling, 44 fantasy points against West Virginia. He is a ball-dominant guard, like ball-dominant is all get out. And when he's hitting his shots is when he tends to have his ceiling games, right? Like you see against Houston, wasn't hitting his shots, two for 14, only 18 fantasy points. But yet against Houston in the first matchup, six for 15, that's only 40%, 35 fantasy points. So if he is like moderately efficient from the field. He's taking enough shots and getting enough volume offensively that he's going to find a way to um, hit value and fancy. And so I do really think you can play DeSue and Ace Miss together or separate, or uh, I just I just think they're great options, y'all. And I think those are the two guys from Texas that you need to be getting to. After that, Mitchell, Hunter, and Weaver are all playing a ton of minutes. To me, Mitchell is a direct pivot off of Dylan Nassou. He doesn't always attempt the most shots, but he can put up peripheral stats in bunches pretty quick, and I definitely don't mind playing Dylan Mitchell in this spot. Tyrese Hunter, it would be kind of like a Max Aceman's pivot, right? Like Tyrese Hunter can have these games where he takes a lot of shots as well. He can have these games where he puts up a ton of peripheral stats, and if the game gets going up and down, it's very likely that he's going to hit value at six thousand dollars. And then Kendall Weaver is kind of like their defensive specialist, and he's playing a ton of minutes for that reason. I really liked playing him when his salary was like forty two hundred. Now that it's fifty two hundred, I don't think he's the best value in the world, but like. This slate's pretty bereft of value, y'all. And I think in terms of the 5K guards, I don't think he's a bad option, especially considering if you play him, you can just keep game stacking this game, get a whole lot of players um, on both sides of this game, and just hope that this is the one that ends up shooting out. And I think it is by far the most likely one to shoot out. If Dylan DeSue were to get in foul trouble, Caden Shedrick would play a lot of minutes. Um, you know, he played 18 minutes against Houston, put up 16 fancy points. Um, 16 minutes against TCU, put up 17 fancy points. Like, he can put up a, over a fancy point per minute quite easily. He was great for filling in for DeSue when DeSue was hurt at the start of the season. And so maybe if you're playing a GPP, you want to play an angle where you're fading Dylan DeSue and, and hoping that he gets in foul trouble. Caden Shedrick would be a guy that would be for you. Brock Cunningham and Ithiel Horton will play off the bench. Um, Brock Cunningham's an interesting guy. I've mentioned him in the past. Like He's a guy that every basketball team should want, but he's not a great fantasy option because he's going to make all the plays that don't show up in the box score, like diving for loose balls and boxing out and, and just doing all the little things, right? But it doesn't result to a whole lot of fantasy points. Ithiel Horton is very shot dependent. If he comes in off the bench and he hits a few threes, he'd give you a solid fantasy performance. But if he's not, then he's going to go right back to the bench and it's not going to be very pretty. So um, I think, you know, along with Day Day Ames, I think he's one of the better punt plays on the slate just because there is the chance that he could get hot from three and you know he's going to be a part of the rotation. All right, so that does it with all three games here on this big Monday slate. Hopefully we're able to give you guys plenty of information um, to help build your DFS lineups on DraftKings as well as FanDuel for this three-game slate. Now, a reminder, if you want more from me from this slate there's and, and more from me from the Tuesday slate, there are places where you can get that. First off, follow me on Twitter at Mike's Money Picks. I will tweet out all updates for the show, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions if you send them my way on Twitter. Join the Fantasy Corner Discord. The link is in the description on YouTube as well as on the audio feed. And I've said it time and time again, but I think we've got one of the, or one of, if not the best Discord for college basketball DFS. A lot of smart people, you know, bounce a lot of ideas off each other. I'll be in there all day, Monday as well as Tuesday, chopping it up, talking lineups, talking plays. And so if you want more from me, that's one place you can get it. And then if you want to know who actually makes my lineups after, you know, all the information that I shared here in this episode, you can check out the articles on my Patreon, patreon.com slash Mike's Money Picks. All right. So. That does it for this episode, guys. Hopefully gave you guys what you need to, to make some solid lineups here on this Monday slate. Reminder, subscribe to the channels. That way you can be back with us for the rest of college basketball season. I hope to be back on here talking college basketball for the Wednesday slate. I'm not going to make any promises because – Midweeks can be kind of rough, especially because I've mentioned here on the podcast before, but I have a five-month-old daughter at home, love her to death, but some nights she just doesn't want to sleep. And so, you know, if we do have one of those nights, it, it makes recording pretty tough. So hopefully we don't have one of those nights this week, and I, I can be back here talking every night on these college basketball sites for you guys. So um, if you made it this far, please hit the like and subscribe buttons. Helps me out a ton. If you're listening on audio, rate and review. Again, helps me out a ton. I really appreciate it. Um, best of luck to you guys here on this Monday slate. Thank you guys for watching and listening, and I will see you next time.